and welcome back to Global Value. In today's video, we're performing a fundamental stock analysis of Huntington Ingalls Industry Inc., ticker symbol HII. Currently, Huntington Ingalls trades for $227.31 per share. Their stock price has done extremely well over the last year in stark contrast to the overall market. Their stock price is up 22% over this time. Over the last five years, however, their stock price is down 4%, so it's pretty much flat. Over 10 years, a totally different story here. Huntington Ingalls has compounded at a rate of 19% annually. And going back about 12 years to when this became a standalone business, Huntington Ingalls has compounded at a rate of 17% annually. Keep in mind that this is not including their dividend yield. Currently, they're paying out a 2.1% dividend yield, which is better than that of the yield of an S&P 500 ETF right now. Huntington Ingalls is trading about $30 below their 52-week high. They're up more than $50 from their 52-week low, and they're a decent-sized business. They have about a $9 billion market cap. For more background about their business, Huntington Ingalls industry was created from the spinoff of Northrop Grumman's shipbuilding business. The company is the largest independent military shipbuilder. The company has three segments, two two of which are shipyards. Ingalls produces non-nuclear powered ships, particularly the American class amphibious assault ship and the Arleigh Burke class destroyer. The Newport News segment produces nuclear powered ships. It is the sole source contractor for the Gerald R. Ford class aircraft carrier and is a major subcontractor to the Columbia class attack submarine. The company's technical solution segment provides uncrewed underseas vehicles as well as provides various IT services to the government. Huntington Ingalls industry was founded in 1886 and is headquartered in Newport News, Virginia. Going through some of the points of the potential long thesis for the business, defense prime contractors operate in an acyclical business and shipbuilders are particularly acyclical, which could offer some protection as the U.S. is currently in a recession. Huntington Ingalls is one of the two major shipbuilders for the U.S. Navy, which is a difficult to replicate business. The U.S. has a vested interest in maintaining the financial viability of the company, and the national defense strategy prioritizes modern the military to counter potential great power adversaries. It's thought that this will increase the proportion of defense budget available to contractors. Then for a potential short thesis on the business, Fincantary Marinette Marine won the Constellation class frigate contract and it's expected that this company will be a competitor on future contracts. Huntington Ingalls used capital to acquire Alien a defense services company which is outside the firm's sphere of competence, and the United States has enacted substantial fiscal stimulus in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, which may depress future defense spending. Those are key points from both a potential long and a potential short thesis of the business. So for our fundamental analysis today, we are performing the select six analysis, taking a checklist style approach of six standard financial metrics to come to a holistic and beginning understanding of Huntington Ingalls based off of their business fundamentals. So this analysis is still a work in progress and it's an opportunity to learn in public, it will continue to improve and get better over time. So with that said, let's get right into today's analysis. Starting off with metric number one, we want their average return on capital over the last five years to be above 14%. So there are two major reasons for this. The first is that over the long run, over the course of decades, a stock is likely to return approximately what its underlying business returns. And the second is that the average publicly listed business earns about a 7% return on capital. So by asking for 14% or higher here as our benchmark, we can potentially build in some margin of safety for ourselves based off the overall quality of the business being about twice as good as average. So over this time, Huntington Ingalls has seen their returns on capital decline. They hit their low for this period last year. However, their returns on capital have upticked some over their last 12 months. They're earning about 12% returns on capital. Even still averaged out over this time frame, Huntington Ingalls is producing about 24.5% returns on capital on average. This is well above the 14% mark we're looking for and more than three times better than that of an average business. So this is a strong check to start off on metric number one. Metric number two, here we're looking for growth in the company's financials. We want to see revenue, net income, and free cash flow growth over the last five years. And this metric is all or nothing in nature. Either all three of these are going to be up for a check, or if even one of them is down, this entire metric will be an X. So over this time, Huntington Ingalls has grown their revenues by more than 40%, which includes their last 12 months worth of numbers. Their earnings are also up 20%. However, their free cash flows are where they get into trouble. Their free cash flows have fallen by two thirds, about 66% over this time. They're down significantly over their last 12 months from where they were to end 2021. And so this means that this is gonna be an X here on metric number two. And unfortunately, of these three, free cash flow is probably the one that we care the most about because free cash flow is really the lifeblood of any business. And a business can use free cash flows to buy back shares, pay down debt, make acquisitions, pay dividends, or reinvest back into the business. So ultimately, a business's abilities to produce free cash flows now and until Judgment Day 
discounted back by some reasonable interest rate is what that business is going to be worth. So it's not a great sign to see that their free cash flows are down, especially over their last 12 months. Next up for metric number three, here we're taking a look at the business from the perspective of an individual shareholder in the company by looking at them on a per share basis. We want to see earnings per share growth over the last five years. We learned in the previous metric that they've grown their earnings by more than 20% over this time frame, And at the same time, they've repurchased about 12% of their shares outstanding. This means that the numerator in this earnings per share equation has increased as well as the denominator has decreased as they've had more earnings split out over a smaller share count. And so this is a check here on metric number three. It's likely a good sign for existing shareholders that they're repurchasing shares, especially such a high volume of shares, because when you purchase a share of stock, what you're really buying is a fractional ownership percentage in that underlying business. And so when a business buys back shares by decreasing the amount of stock that they have outstanding, they're increasing your ownership percentage in the business, which is ultimately going to increase your percentage of the business's profits without you having to pay a dime. So it's almost as if the business is making an acquisition of itself in part, and so just like any other acquisition, we want a company to be buying back shares when they're getting more value than what they're paying. We want share buybacks that are acquisitive for existing shareholders going forward. You may have to do some more research into what valuations they were particularly buying these shares back in. But either way, this is another check here on metric number three, and we are two for three to start things off. Next up, metric number four is going to be very similar. Here we're looking for free cash flow per share growth over the past five years. Even though their free cash flows per share were up from fiscal 2017 to fiscal 2021, they are down quite significantly over their last 12 months as their free cash flows have really fallen off a cliff. So over their last 12 months, they're only producing about $3.54 worth of free cash flow per share. Again, this is down two thirds from where this was in 2017. So even with their 12% buybacks, that's not enough to outpace their massive decline in their free cash flows. And so this is going to be an X on metric number four here. So, so far through our first four metrics, we are split evenly. We have two checks and two Xs. Next up for metric number five, here we're evaluating how the business is utilizing leverage. So we don't want to be investing in overly levered businesses because during economic downturns, it's overly levered businesses that are at the greatest risk of poor outcomes. So specifically for metric number five, we want their net debt, which is total debt minus cash and short-term investments to be below the amount of free cash flow that they produced over their last five years. So Huntington Ingalls ended last year with $2.9 billion worth of net debt. They added on significantly from 2020 to 2021, more than doubling their net debt. And they've continued to add on incrementally. Currently, they have $3.1 billion worth of net debt. And unfortunately, over the last five years, they've only produced $2.4 billion worth of free cash flow. So that means that they're employing more leverage in their business than we'd ideally be looking for. Again, this may be a particularly special situation as they are a defense contractor and a very niche defense contractor at that. However, their debt loads have certainly increased compared to where they've been at historically. And it's not great for the business that at the same time that they're increasing their debt load, their free cash flow has also been declining. So this increase in their net debt came as a result of their acquisition of Allianz Science and Technology, which they paid $1.65 billion for in an all cash acquisition last year. So while their increase in net debt has not come from the business adding on more debt, they have used up a lot of their on-hand cash to make this acquisition. Ultimately, you're going to want to dig in and learn more about that acquisition to understand if that acquisition is going to add value for existing Huntington Ingalls shareholders going forward. So again, this is an X on metric number five. And so far through our first five metrics, we have two checks and three X's. The big metric of them all, metric number six, we want their average free cash flow to their total enterprise value to give us a yield that's above 5%. And if this is the case, this will give us a potential risk premium to the rate of the 10-year treasury yield and potentially give us another reason to be interested in Huntington Ingalls. We're using their total enterprise value here because it's going to give us a picture of the economic reality of the business that's going to be more similar to as if Huntington Ingalls were a private company. Currently, they have a $12.2 billion total enterprise value. So enterprise value is taking into account both their market cap and their net debt position. Then we also learned that over their last five years, they produced $2.4 billion worth of free cash flow. This means that in an average year, they're producing about $480 million worth of free cash flow. So when we divide their $400 million of average free cash flow by their $12.2 billion total enterprise value, that gives us an average free cash flow to enterprise value yield of 3.9%. So that's just above the rate of the 10-year treasury yield right now. 
However, that is below that 5% mark we we're looking for. Also worth being aware of is that their free cash flows over their last 12 months are down very significantly from where they've been at averaged out historically. So over their last 12 months, they've only produced $142 million worth of free cash flow. So to get a current free cash flow to enterprise value yield for the business, when we divide their $142 million of their current free cash flows by their $12.2 billion total enterprise value, that only gives us a 1% current free cash flow to enterprise value yield there. So both on an average and a current basis, this is coming in below that 5% benchmark we're looking for. And so this is an X here on metric number six. Then here we're looking at Huntington Ingalls dividend profile. So currently they're paying out a 2.1% dividend yield, which is slightly better than that of an S&P 500 ETF. However, people make mistakes all the time by blindly chasing dividend yields, so it's important to stop and look at the fundamentals of a business and to determine whether or not a company's dividends are well supported by their cash flows or their earnings, depending on the type of business. For Huntington Ingalls, we want their dividends to be supported by their cash flows, and in all five of these fiscal years, that seems to have been the case. They increased their dividends in all five of these years, and they grew their cash flows over this time cumulatively. However, their last 12 months worth of free cash flow are not enough to support what their dividend payouts are currently. So it either looks like the company is going to be paying out dividends through some of the cash that they have on hand by raising more debt, or they'd have to potentially slash their dividend payouts if they're not able to pick up their free cash flows. So this is potentially the trouble with making a big acquisition like that of nearly $1.7 billion when they only have about a $9 billion total market cap. That's a pretty big acquisition given the size of their business. And then to follow that up with a year where their cash flows are down pretty significantly from where they had been, that could be potentially a tough one-two punch, at least during the short term. Again, to learn more about the long-term prospects of Huntington Ingalls, you would want to read through their SEC filings and do your own due diligence to learn more about the business. Then finally, here we're using a discounted cash flow model to come to a potential fair value for Huntington Ingalls. So starting with an average of their free cash flows over their last five years, Again, this is not where their cash flows are at currently. If we were to project their current free cash flows out into the future, things would look pretty awful for the business. So we're using an average of their free cash flows, assuming that they're able to get back to their average baseline. Then using historical growth assumptions based off the abilities of the business to grow their free cash flows since 2010, it's up to you to determine whether or not these assumptions are going to be accurate and applicable potentially going forward over the next 20 years to give a baseline projected estimate for Huntington Ingalls. So assuming a growth stage over the next 10 years where they grow their free cash flows at a rate of 12.5% annually, then assuming a terminal stage out over the next 10 years after that, so projecting 20 years into the future in total where their cash flows fall in half and they're only growing at a rate of about 6% annually, then we're not including their tangible book value because that's skewed based off how the accounting is done for their share buybacks. If we were seeking a 10% rate of return from Huntington Ingalls, then it looks like a potential fair value for the business would be about $222 per share. So that's pretty much in line with what their stock price is at right now. Please be aware that this discount rate would be including their dividend payments, so dividends would not be doubly counted here. So it looks like their stock price would be changing by about 8% annually. Also, a discounted cash flow model, just like any other model in any other discipline, is going to have its outputs be sensitive to its inputs. Deeper work about the company is going to help you determine more accurate inputs here, potentially. Then most importantly, this type of analysis is not financial advice. It's not a buy or sell recommendation of any security. And before considering any potential investment decision, please consult with the properly licensed and registered legal and financial professionals. One resource that will definitely help you stay up to speed with what's going on in the market and help you learn more about the business is Seeking Alpha. Checking out Seeking Alpha directly supports the channel as I'm part of their affiliate program. So most of you probably know Seeking Alpha as a source of community written articles on different stocks. But over the past little while, they've actually become a lot more than that with their new offering, which is Seeking Alpha Premium. Premium has a number of different features where you can track buy, hold, and sell ratings on your favorite stocks. These ratings are from the Seeking Alpha community, Wall Street analysts, and Seeking Alpha's algorithm. You can see earnings call transcripts, investor presentations, SEC filings, and press releases all in one place. You can add your own margin of safety targets and get alerts for when your favorite stocks hit that level. You can get unlimited access to Seeking Alpha articles, and you can take your reading experience based on the type of investor you are. You can get 10 years of financial data on any stock 
doc to help you with your analysis. You can also import your portfolio into your Seeking Alpha dashboard to make researching easier. And if that didn't convince you, the best thing is that an annual plan is only 99 bucks. That's only 27 cents per day through my referral link down in the description below. Normally premium is $239, but they are currently running a general offer for $119. But if you use my link, it's only 99 bucks. So check it out if you're interested. So in summary, Huntington Ingalls Industries checks the box on two out of six of our metrics. They're earning pretty solid average returns on capital in the mid 20s, even though those returns have dipped down slightly over the past couple of years. It looks like they have the potential to get back to where they have been at historically. They've grown their revenues by nearly 40% over the last five years, and they've increased their earnings by 20% as well. However, over their last 12 months, their free cash flows have fallen off a cliff. Their free cash flows are down by more than two thirds. At the same time, Huntington Ingalls has managed to repurchase about 12% of their shares outstanding over the last five years. And while they did complete a sizable $1.7 billion acquisition last year, that deal was at least in all cash. So it does look like even though the business has more net debt than what their cash flows are currently able to support, at least the company was paying for that acquisition in cash and was not having to take out a bunch of debt to fund that. Although so far, based off their last 12 months worth of free cash flows, it looks like that acquisition has not been doing much to help the business. Then on both an average and a current basis, comparing their free cash flows to their enterprise value, that was not giving us the yield that would give us a potentially adequate risk premium to the rate of the 10-year treasury yield currently. The business did not look overly attractive based off of that valuation metric. Then their dividends had grown strongly over the past five years, and they were well supported by cash flows in all five of those years. However, that's not the case over their last 12 months. The company is either going to have to pay out dividends from sources external to their free cash flows, or they're going to have to slash their dividend yield to be able to support that going forward. Long term, the assumption would be that they're able to get back to where they have been historically for their free cash flows. And you can learn more about that by reading through the company's filings. Then finally, performing a discounted cash flow analysis of Huntington Ingalls using historical growth assumptions based off the business's abilities to grow their free cash flows since 2010. If you believe those assumptions and you've done your own due diligence, then it looks like from today's valuations, the business would be returning about a 10% rate of return out over the next 20 years. So it looks like the company would be about fairly valued based on that. It's worth reiterating that this type of analysis is not financial advice. It's not a buy or sell recommendation of any security. And before considering any potential investment decision, please consult with the properly licensed and registered legal and financial professionals. Instead, this analysis serves as a beginning and holistic understanding of Huntington Ingalls Industries to help you determine whether or not it's worth your time and energy to dig in and learn more about the business. Ultimately, as a value investor, you're trying to conduct this future research as if you're going to own 100% of a business and you can understand the essence of that company and know what's important and what's not important for that business going forward. So through this research, you'll learn more about the qualitative and the quantitative aspects of Huntington Ingalls, and you'll be able to likely come to your own determination of what an appropriate intrinsic value for the business will be. So with that said, that's it for today's fundamental stock analysis of Huntington Ingalls Industry, Inc., ticker symbol HII. If you enjoyed today's video, please be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel for more stock analysis videos, and comment down below what business you want me to take a look at next time. Thanks for learning about Huntington Ingalls with me, and have a great day.